the Pac-12 South. And yes, I understand that this is no longer really a division. We know what this was beforehand. We know what teams were in this division. But the Pac-12 is going divisionless going forward. Now, the schedule remains the same. They are still going to play all the same teams, etc. I had a really difficult time trying to, to nail down what I think of the predictions of these teams. This could be a bit of a crapshoot this year. I don't know how we're going to get to some of these records, etc. But, but we're going to go ahead and talk about it. We are going to discuss exactly what's going on in the Pac-12 and specifically the South version of this. We will start off with the Utah Utes. Last year, 10-4, and four, made it to a Rose Bowl, won the Pac-12. Uh, honestly, it was the beginning of last season that really hurt the record because they probably should have only had maybe one loss, two losses, somewhere around there. Uh, the loss to Ohio State in the bowl game, if Cam Rising doesn't get hurt, I think there's a chance they could really win that game. Uh, the loss to San Diego State, if they had played Cam Rising for the entire ball game. I think they win that game in regulation and they don't lose it in overtime, etc. So I think uh, there's a lot that you can look at from last season and feel really good about, especially coming into this season. 66% returning production here for Kyle Whittingham's bunch. Uh, this is a team that returns quite a bit on offense. 73%. Uh, let's see. Let's go over this. Their win total is nine for this year. Uh, odds to win the conference. Um 2.75 to 1, or plus 275, somewhere around there. And that's a pretty decent odds, pretty decent odds. Projected favorites in nine games. They got five toss-ups this year. Uh, the offensive coordinator, Andy Ludwig, has been awesome since he came back. Uh, and I think he was kind of kind of Derek Mason's downfall at Vandy because Ludwig was at Vandy, and they were doing pretty decent. Uh, remember, I mean, he, he had Vanderbilt in bowl games, like Derek Mason did. So, regardless, last year, Utah... Actually, a better offensive performance than defensive performance. A little strange, right? Uh, number 17 in PPA per drive on offense. Number 33 on defense. Uh, look, this is a well-coached team. Number 25 in penalties per game. Uh, turnover margin was a bit of an issue, but when you get a little more risk-heavy in your offense, you're going you're gonna to have turnovers. That's just bound to happen. Uh, on offense... Rising took over. The offense averaged 39 points per game over the last 10 games. They were number 13 in passing success rate. And they returned the wide receivers, uh, Vele and the tight ends, uh, Quit and uh, uh, Kincaid, Dalton Kincaid. Uh, number 30 rushing success could actually increase with the running backs, Thomas and Bernard coming back, along with definitely a top 20 offensive line. And they could be even better than that. So rushing success rate was number 30 last year. I, I expect it to be a little bit better this go-round. Uh, as far as the defense, we all know what to expect from a Whittingham defense. Six starters gone, but Fillinger and Tafuna, a return to the defensive line. The cornerbacks, Phillips and Vaughn, are great. Linebacker Gabe Reed transfers over from Stanford. The safeties, Bishop and Vaughn, could be ready to turn into stars as sophomores. Like, this is typically your biggest learning curve right here. It's when you show the most improvement, the most growth, is from your freshman to sophomore year. I, I, I think they're going to be awesome. Uh, all Pac-12 cornerback uh, Jatravius Bruton is back healthy as well. Remember, he was really, really good in 2020 and then had to miss last season. He's back again. So, uh, defense has star players. They got a lot of good dudes. Top players here, Cam Rising, of course. Thomas, the running back. Uh, you know, the two tight ends. You got the cornerback, Phillips. Uh, Gabe Reed coming over from Stanford. That is a huge deal uh, because he's really going to fill in a hole there. Keys to the season. They were number seven in field position last year. Uh, that is, you need to maintain that. And they've typically been pretty good at that metric. Number 25 in points per scoring opportunity, number seven in points per play. The offense was lights out last year, and I expect them to be again with Cam Rising. Uh, I know that they are losing, I didn't even put it on here, uh, the linebacker Devin Lloyd. They're losing uh, Tatua. They're losing Nick Ford. They're losing Sewell, et cetera. Uh, the wide receiver, uh, Britton, like this is they're losing dudes, but they got guys to replace them. They have built depth. They have developed their players, and I feel really, really good about them. Really good, so good in fact. Um, 
Oh, I, I put on here, the defense won't be to the highest standards, but they'll be plenty good enough to go with that offense. And I said, this is the epitome of physical football or man ball, if you will, because I expect both lines to be pretty, pretty good. I've got them 11-1. and one. Now, their win total is 9. I feel good about that over uh, because I think that 9 is the floor. Like, I, I look at this, and, yeah, there's like five toss-ups, and toss-ups to me are games where uh, it's a one-possession spread. I think when I look at the schedule, it sets up insanely well for them to... I, I understand I, I've got them losing at Florida. I got them beating everybody else. I got running through the back 12 They kind of did that last year because once they got on a roll with that offense, nobody was able to beat them. I think the same thing's going to happen here. I've got them 11-1. and one. I think this is a playoff caliber team. So, yeah, 11-1 and one for Utah. I think that this team is really, really good. Like, really good. Oh, reminder, by the way, if anybody wants to see those spreadsheets uh, that, I, that I have on the screen with me, they're over on the website. You can go check them out over there. Uh, there's a link in the description to that. So, go ahead and check that out. Um, We'll move on. We will move on, and this one is a a tricky one. Very, very tricky. The Arizona State Sun Devils. Herm Edwards went 8-5 and five last year, and they lose basically everybody. Like, I, I don't know that the list is, is big enough, right? Linebacker Eric Gentry, Ricky Persall, uh, Jaden Daniels all transferred out. DJ Davidson's gone. Um, the cornerbacks are gone. The defensive end, Tyler Johnson's gone. Rashad White, the running back, he is headed off to the NFL, etc. Like, this is a train wreck. They are number 119 in returning production. Uh, it's even worse on offense, or I guess it's about the same on offense, 44% returning production on offense. It's They're completely flipping this thing over. It, it's a train wreck because all of the coaches are gone. Like, the only coach that wasn't let go due to NCAA rules, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, was the head coach, Herm Edwards. And tell me how that happens. I mean, I got no idea. Uh, we'll start with the offense here. The new OC is Glenn Thomas. He comes over from UNLV where he wasn't exactly... Uh, he wasn't super successful, but it wasn't like the worst. He he followed Matt Rule from Temple to Baylor, jumped over to UNLV when Matt Rule went to uh, the NFL. So, like, he, he's been good. He's been around winning programs. So, maybe this will work. Uh, the question here on offense, who's the quarterback going to be? Is it Emory Jones or is it Paul Tyson? I would imagine it's Jones uh, because I don't think they would have been looking for a transfer quarterback if they thought they had something with Tyson, especially that late in the game. Uh, they're going to rely a lot more on the pass this year after losing so much from that number one rushing success rate team last year. Uh, they were awesome at running the football last year, but they lose a ton of it. Uh, a lot of transfers out, a lot of transfers in. Uh, Wyoming uh, running back Zazavian Valade and Vandy wide receiver Cam Johnson came in as transfers. Uh, the offensive line depth looks fairly strong. You know, they, they've they got a lot to figure out here. Just a ton to figure out. Uh, does Glenn Thomas bring a new scheme, or do they continue to run the same thing that they've been doing? And is Brian Billick really calling the shots? Like, is he is he the guy that's really kind of running this ship? I'm curious. Uh, on defense, new D.C. is Donnie Henderson. He was part of that 2000 Ravens defensive staff, which, of course, Brian Billick was the head coach, etc. You get the point. Only 55% returning production from a defense that was number 23 in points per play allowed last year. Uh, six new transfers, very talented. The roster looks good. I mean, it, the defensive roster, according to CFB Winning Edge, number 29 in roster strength in the country. That's pretty good. The offense, not quite to that point, number 59, but regardless. Uh, the front seven should be pretty good this year. But just like everything else on this team, it's a crapshoot trying to figure out, um, you know, exactly how this bunch will gel. With Are there going to be chemistry issues? Are there going to be anything like that? I, I'm very curious. Uh, the keys to the season here, you know, they're projected favorites in eight games, even with all the turnover because of the, you know, all the, all the mess. Their win total sits at six and a half. Um, let's talk about the keys first. Ton of turnover. On offense, a lot of upperclassmen, new faces, so that that could be good. You got a bunch of seniors that really want to go out on a on a high note. This could either go to the moon or it could crash and burn quickly. 
I kind of think it's going to crash and burn, but we'll we'll talk about that here in a second. Defense, much the same. Um, obvious strength on the defensive line, but a lot of new faces, so you just got to roll the dice and see what you got, I guess. Uh, along with that, at the schedule, I mean, has a chance to blow this team up very quickly. In the first six games, they play at Oklahoma State, Utah, at USC, and Washington. I mean, this is this is tough. This is really, really difficult. Uh, they've got eight games that they're projected favorites in, but nine of the 12 games are projected to be within one score. So, yeah, I have a feeling that things are not going to go well. This feels like a dumpster fire. And I don't think I'm alone in thinking that because if you start out early and you get some good wins and you feel good about yourself, you feel like you're playing for something. You start to lose some of those games early. Like you going on the road at Oklahoma State in week two, that's going to get tricky because then you've got Utah coming up on September 24th at USC on October 1st, and then you play Washington. I I look at this, I see five and seven on the schedule, so I, I would think the under, which the under is juiced at minus 135 over at BetUS, but this feels like it could go south in a hurry. Uh, I don't know that Herm survives this year, but we will see. We will certainly see, because that is going to be, I mean, just a tricky situation to navigate. Good gracious. Good gracious. All right. Uh, let's hit one more. We'll take a little break, and then we'll come back and knock out the next three. But we'll move on to the mighty, mighty UCLA Bruins. Now, Chip Kelly heading into his fifth season here. They went 8-4 and four last year. Projected, uh, not projected, excuse me, post-game win expectancy. Actually had them closer to nine wins and only three losses. So, you know. You look at some of these things like penalties per game. They were number 102. Um, turnover, turnover margin was pretty good last year for DTR in that offense. Regardless, uh, let's let's look at this. Their win total sits at 8.5, uh, juice the same to go over and under. They were projected favorites in 11 games. That's not bad. I mean, really not bad. Um, are the odds there that they will win all of those 11 games? Probably not. They've got five toss-ups. That's games... That will be within one score. (sighs) Let's look at this offense here. Number one points per game offense in the Pac-12 last year, 36.5. DTR is back at quarterback. Charbonnet is back at running back. The offensive line has plenty of depth. The question here, of course, wide receiver and tight ends. What is the development process like? What are they going to do this season? Do they have enough of it? Team was number 23 with 88 drives inside the 40 last year, but number 57 with only 3.94 points scored per opportunity. Uh, They were number 32 in red zone conversions. I mean, they were 44 out of 50 in that spot, but they were only number 50 in red zone trips. So what what that tells me here, if you're number 50 in red zone trips, but you're number 23 in drives inside the 40, you got 88 drives that you made it inside the opponent's 40-yard line, and you've only got 50 trips inside the 20. That means that... Let's see, 28 times, 38 times, 38 different times you made it inside the opponent's 40-yard line and you didn't get inside the 20. That's crazy to me. It seems like they need to be able to finish some drives. That's all I'm saying. Like, once you get into the red zone, yeah, that's one thing. But you got to improve that this year for sure. Uh, The rushing success was great. The passing success uh, left something to be wanting, for sure. Number 35, but they, you know, they were okay. They were okay. Uh, The defense here. Defense was a problem. They could run the football, but they couldn't actually stop the run. And that's a bit of an issue. So, uh, number 111 in rushing success right there. Number 84 in PPA per drive. Uh, they're not good. I mean, it's not not being able to stop the run is not good when you play against Arizona State, USC, Utah, etc. Because those teams are going to run the football, and they're going to run a lot. Um, no players are back that reach 200 snaps on the defensive line. That's not good, so not a lot of experience there. Linebacker looks stacked thanks to transfers and, uh, and Calvert coming back. The secondary depth ain't there. Like, I don't know how this unit improves, and that's kind of an issue. Uh, Chase Cota coming in on the offense is certainly a big deal 
Uh, I think he's going to be their number one playmaker. Um, excuse me. Chase Coda transferred. Who was I looking for? They got somebody in, and I didn't put it down. Okay, you can let me know in the comments how's that, <laughs> so that we don't, don't waste a bunch of time. Offense is the obvious strength here, looking at the keys. Um, got to figure out wide receiver and tight end. The biggest thing will be converting more drives inside the opponent 40-yard line, as I was talking about. Defense was a liability last year. Doesn't look like it's improved a lot, especially with number 113 returning production here. I mean, they're only bringing back 48% of their production. Um, and the transfers that are coming in are good. It's just I don't know that there were enough of them to make a huge difference. Uh, is there a next level for Chip Kelly at this point? Like last year, made it to eight and four, made it to a bowl game, ended up not playing in the bowl game. But regardless, uh, you know, is this is this what they are? Uh, it's what I'm curious about. I mean, they missed an opportunity to own L.A. Uh, before USC got their act together. Is it just a pretty good program? Is there more that they want to do with this program? Like I've I've got them nine and three. Um, the win total is eight and a half. I, you know, nine and three, eight and four, somewhere around there. Like that feels about right. I've got them at nine and three with the win over. I've got them beating USC, but I've got a loss to Arizona State, which seems like it'd be fitting, right? Uh, lost to Arizona State, lost to Oregon, lost to Utah. Uh, the non conference, by the way, they got really smart with this non conference. Bowling Green, Alabama State, and South Alabama. Exactly what you're supposed to be doing. A few years ago, they were playing all kind of different bunches and uh, and couldn't win any of them. So, you want to go to bowl games? You want to have good records? Yeah, schedule right. Just letting you know. All right, let's hit some of these, and then we'll come back with USC. Let's take a break from the show for just a minute to give you some info on things you should know about. Follow the show on Twitter, at Winning Cures, or you can follow the guys at GaryWCE and at Chris B. Giannini, or you can also follow us on Facebook. If you want more content from me, Gary, visit BetUSTV.com. I host the How to Gamble on Sports Show and, from August through January, the BetUS College Football Show. You can subscribe to both on YouTube. Got your own podcast or web show? Looking to start one? Or you're just curious how we look and sound so good? Well, we've got all the gear that we use listed on our gear page on the website. If you order using our links, you'll be supporting the show, too. If you're interested in advertising on a show that reaches over 80,000 unique football fans per month during the season, send an email to Gary at winningcureseverything.com, and we'll put together a plan that best fits you or your business. And now, back to the show. All right, so we dive into the USC Trojans and what a ridiculous turnover we have had at Troy. Whew, let's look at the numbers. Last year was not good. Number 104 in PPA margin. Uh, they went 4-8. and eight. Post-game win expectancy actually had them as a four-win team. So it wasn't even like they had a bunch of upsets where they should have won, etc. They just were not a good football team last year. Uh, it, it, this team, after that Stanford loss, there were games where it certainly looked like they just quit. And obviously, I hate using that word, but this team was the epitome of that. They just didn't look like they wanted to be there a lot of the time. Uh, I mean, they, there, there were some games where they actually showed up against BYU late in the season. They certainly showed up and tried to win that game. But also, you turned around late, late on Championship Saturday and played against Cal and had no desire to finish out that season. None whatsoever. So, regardless, uh, they lose some pretty talented players. Drake London, Keontae Ingram, Drake Jackson... Uh, Chris Steele is gone. Like Jacob uh, Lickenstein, like he's gone. Like they they lost some good dudes, but uh, you look at this roster strength. It's number seven overall, number three on offense, number twenty five on defense. They brought in a bunch of talent, just a bunch of talent. We'll start off with the offense here. Uh, it's a Lincoln Riley offense. I mean, come on, you you know exactly what you're going to get here. You got uh, Caleb Williams at quarterback. You've got Jordan Addison and Mario Williams at wide receiver, along with other guys as well. I'm just naming off the the big names and whatnot. Uh, the running backs, Travis Dye, they also brought in Davis from Stanford. Uh, an offensive line led by uh, the left tackle, Andrew Voorhees. Like, this offense is probably going to be awesome. Now, I say probably because these are all just a bunch of pieces that you're trying to meld together into a team. What's the chemistry going to be like, et cetera? 
I'm really curious. There's no way to look at last season stats and have any idea what this year is going to look like. Uh, but you can look at Oklahoma's a little bit. Oklahoma ran the ball 52.6% of the time. Is USC going to do that with all that star power at wide receiver? Like, that's that's what I'm curious about. They ran it a bunch because they figured out quickly that their passing offense was not quite up to snuff. Caleb Williams has shown signs of brilliance, but going into another season, a, a second season with Lincoln Riley, does he open up that passing game a little bit more does he feel more comfortable throwing the football as opposed to resorting to uh, taking off and running with it? That's what I would like to know. So if he hasn't, like if he's still running the ball like that, uh, I'm very curious, very curious what it's going to look like. Um, on top of that, we'll move on to the defense. This is obviously the weakness. There is talent, obviously, but the offense has the majority of it. Now, on defense, you got a bunch of transfers coming in, 11 new guys. Uh, it's not a lot of star power. It's guys like the linebacker Shane Lee that played at Alabama quite a bit, um, you know, but not not guys that were starting at most places, et cetera. They do have some, regardless. Uh, the defensive line is number 38 in terms of talent. They returned three players with 290-plus snaps, so, you know, there's some experience there coming back, but is that the experience that you want? Uh, what is Alex Grinch going to be able to do with these guys? The linebacker only has one returning player with over 150 snaps. Uh, in the secondary, ton of transfers. Ton of tra- I, you got no idea how these guys are going to meld together, what the chemistry is going to be like, et cetera. Uh, they're projected favorites in 10 games. Their win total is 9.5, uh, just the same for both over at BetUS. Uh, the conference odds, I mean, they are 2-1. to one. That might be a bit of a stretch early on. I mean, I know that there's a lot of hype around this program. Uh Let's talk keys to the season here. Completely unprojectable. That's that's the key to the season here. <laughs> Lots of talent, but how does it gel? Uh, you know, D could be good. The vast majority of the talent's on the offense, but if Caleb Williams isn't improved as a passer, then what do you do, right? Are Travis Dye and Austin Davis good enough to carry this offense if they can't get the ball to the receivers? Like, they'll, they'll have to figure out something. And I, I trust Lincoln Riley to have a good offense, for sure. Um, I can't begin to explain how useless last year's numbers are. <laughs> this is a completely different team. Completely different team. Um, 21 transfers, 16 graduates or NFL guys are gone. So that's 37 total players out. And they brought in eight recruits and 19 transfers so far uh, to make 27 in. So they lost 37 guys, and they brought in 27. Uh, the five-game stretch starting in week three is going to determine whether or not this is, team is a Pac-12 title contender. Uh, you got Fresno, you got at Oregon State, Arizona State, Washington State, and at Utah. Like, that stretch right there is you're going to figure out what this team is. Uh, the only game that I've got them losing in that stretch is at Utah. I've got them losing at UCLA because I think UCLA has a way more experienced team, et cetera, this season. I expect that to shift. Look at this very much the same way that you saw Nick Saban's first season at Alabama go, right? Tommy Tuberville and the Auburn Tigers beat Alabama in the first year. And then the next year, Alabama crushed them. That's what I kind of see happening here, right? I I think that Lincoln Riley's the new kid on the block. Um, I think he's going to get a win over Notre Dame, et cetera. But as far as the battle for L.A. goes, Chip Kelly and his experience team the guys that have been there with him the whole time, they are going to want that game much more than I think USC will. So uh, so I'll give that one to, to UCLA. But that, that's still got USC at 10-2. and two. So, I mean, that goes over. I don't feel great about it. Could I see him losing another game somewhere? Yeah, I could see him losing to Notre Dame. I could see him losing to Washington State, uh, at Oregon State. I mean, hell, Fresno State. Like, there's all kind of stuff. And never count out Stanford, I guess, in, in that game in Week 2. But I would imagine this bunch wants to come in and make a statement because that loss to Stanford is really what lost Clay Hilton his job last year. So that is the way that I would look at that. Um, I mean, this that looks like it's going to be a lot of fun in Troy. But with the defense and a still young, a somewhat young offense, trying to figure out everything in year one, all these guys trying to figure out how to play in the Pac-12, and I know that a bunch of the transfers came from Pac-12 teams. I get that. I just think it's going to be a little more tricky than people want to, uh, than than USC fans want to believe that it will be. So, we'll move on from there. Let's talk about the Colorado Buffaloes. 
And there ain't a whole lot to talk about with Colorado. Uh, Carl Durrell last year went 4-8. and And the numbers were so bad in this situation. You see that little bit of green right there on your screen. Um, Right there, if you can see it. They... They were number 27 in the country in turnover margin, but they were number 110 in PPA margin. So I'm going to assume that that's how they got to four wins. Their postgame win expectancy said that they should have been a three-win team. Uh, They didn't make a lot of sense last year, and they lose a ton. Just an absolute metric ton. Uh, On the defensive line, uh, running back, uh, wide receivers, the cornerbacks, I mean, just everything. They had a bunch of guys transfer out. Uh, they brought in uh, Mike Sanford to be the offensive coordinator. Um, like they, If you didn't include the games that they played against Arizona or FCS teams, their offense only averaged 15.6 points per game. That probably ain't going to cut it. Uh, number 35 in returning production. Uh, experience will be good, I guess, on offense, but they were number 120 in PPA per drive on offense. I mean, this team was not great. Uh, the only really good thing that they had was they were number 85 in rushing success rate, but Jarek Broussard transferred out. So, I mean, their leading pass catcher was the tight end Russell with 307 yards receiving. Um, and the leading wide receiver that they had, the actual wide receiver, not a tight end, uh, was Rice, and he transferred out. So, I mean, this isn't exactly promising. Uh, on defense... You know, they fired Tyson Summers last year. Uh, They promote the defense coordinator, Chris Wilson. He was a defensive line coach for Colorado. All they did was promote him up. And he was in the NFL prior to that with the Arizona Cardinals. Linebacker Josh chandler Samedo from West Virginia is the only transfer that's really expected to contribute. Um, They only got three. There's only three of their front seven starters returning for the number 111 uh, yards per rush defense. They lost six of the best players. Last season went from a 3-4 scheme under Tyson Summers to a 4-3 under the D.C. Chris Wilson. Like, this team's going to be young. I, they're, they're projected favorites in zero games. They've got three games that are expected to be within one score. Uh, and most of those, they're actually underdogs by about a touchdown. This, like, what are they doing with that non-conference? Like, I, that non-conference schedule, TCU at Air Force at Minnesota, I mean, this looks like somebody set them up to fail. This is like Georgia Tech all over again. Uh, only Cal has a lower-rated Pac-12 roster. Like, to give you an example of how bad the team was, they gained 13 turnovers last year. They lost only seven, and they still were awful. Like, they were still 4-8. and eight. So, uh, brutal opening and closing four-game stretches here. I don't know what Carl Durrell's next step is. I don't know what the process is to get better. Uh, It's starting to crumble in year three. You look at this schedule, I've got them 0-12. Now, the numbers would say that they should win about three ballgames, but you got three toss-ups here. The way that everything shakes out, I I got nothing. I I couldn't find a win on the schedule. I think they'll get one somewhere when we least expect it. But, like, this team was really bad. And I don't think that the coaching hires are great. And I don't I don't feel good about this team. I will certainly say that. And, and if you're a Colorado fan, I want you to jump in and tell me. Like, what is there to be excited about? Like, this was a less than inspired hire when it happened. Obviously, it was late in the game when Mel Tucker went to Michigan State. But we see what Michigan State is doing. Colorado, and I understand the desire to be a football power is different at Michigan State as opposed to Colorado. But does Col- like does Colorado just not care at all? Where is the investment from the program? Where where are the expectations from the higher ups? What my question is: What is Carl Durrell doing? Like I understand that you need help from from the higher ups. You need help from your boosters, etc. I mean. What, I don't I don't understand the moves. I really don't have any idea what what the moves are. Um, I mean, it's just mind blowing. Now, polar opposite here, 
Let's go over to Arizona. And Jed Fish went 1-11 last year. That is three wins less than Colorado. But I expect him to have more wins than Colorado this year because I don't think Colorado will have any. Um, 1.89 post-game win expectancy last year, so they expected them to be closer to 2-10 and 10 as opposed to 1-11. and 11. Uh, But they had a really difficult non-conference last year. They're doing it again this year. I mean, just, what are you doing? This is ridiculous. Um, I do feel good about them. I do. I, I think they win a couple of those non-conference games. Now, would it shock me if they don't? Not in the slightest. But I think that they have upgraded the talent here. They're up to number 68 roster in the country, number 58 on offense, number 74 on defense. They've got 20, uh, excuse me, the number 23 returning offense in the country, 77% is coming back. Um, I look at this, like the offensive coordinator, Brennan Carroll was an offensive line coach for the Seahawks for five years. Uh, the quarterbacks coming in, Jaden DeLara, and then, of course, the recruit, uh, Noah Fafita, who looks like he's going to be a stud. Th- th- that should be big improvement at the quarterback position where they were number 108 in passing success rate last year, number 110 in QBR in 21. And you should expect a youth movement on offense for sure. 19 freshmen or sophomores expected to be on the offensive too deep. Like Now, that includes uh, uh, cowing the wide receiver uh, from Utah, but... The talent upgrade is, is pretty obvious here. Like, they've got some players that just got to get them to gel right. They got to get them to develop right. Uh, on defense, Don Brown took the UMass head coaching job. New DC is Johnny Nansen, who is a defensive line coach at UCLA. I think he'll be okay. We'll see. I mean, Don Brown was very aggressive. I, ex- I expect uh, Nansen to kind of play a little more off the ball, a little more that, you know, come to us as opposed to we're going to take you down. But we'll, we'll see. We'll see what that looks like. The offense could dictate a lot of this as well. Uh, Arizona's defense allowed 371 yards per game in 21, first time since 2010 that it was less than 400. That's that's 11 seasons. That's crazy. Absolutely crazy. Uh, the nose guards, uh, Bars and Harris, uh, those guys are, are studs on the defensive line. One's a defensive end, excuse me, Harris is a defensive end. Uh, number 76 rushing success rate should improve with the transfers, you know, linebackers, Eccles, Solomon, Mercier, uh, seven defensive backs return with 350 plus snaps. Pass defense is going to be fine. I mean, they were number 39 with passing success rate on defense. So I feel good about that. Their only projected favorites in one game, their win total is two and a half to go over is juiced at minus 170 over at Bet US. I, I wouldn't bet the conference odds, you know, plus 250. Um, or no, sorry, 250 to one. That's a, that's a lot different. They ain't going to win the conference this year. I'll tell you that. Uh, but Jaden Delara coming in for Washington State, certainly a step up at quarterback. They, they've they got some good things going on. They were dead last in turnover margin last year. They were number 129 in penalties per game. They can improve if those are not cleaned up. you got to find a way to not beat yourself. How does the offense look with actual capable quarterbacks? Like I was just saying, with Jaden Delara, et cetera. Are they going to shock everyone and come out firing? Uh, the ratio was basically 50-50 rush to pass last year. Jed Fish in the NFL, like I think he understands that you've got to be able to run the football somewhat. But as far as the college game goes, like you got to run whatever the other team can't stop. So if you are really good at throwing the football, you better be slinging it. Still a building process, but the roster looks capable of competing this year. Uh, curious to see what they're going to end up doing next. I don't expect a ton of wins. I've got them sitting at 3-9. and nine. Uh, But those wins are over San Diego State, North Dakota State, and Colorado. I'd swap them around. I, I expect about three wins this year. Like I said, win total is two and a half. I expect them to get over that, and it's highly juiced at that. So obviously, Vegas expects that as well. Bet US, whatnot. But three and nine looks about right. That's the, the way that I would go. That is the way that I would go with it. I, I like Arizona. I'm curious what they're going to end up doing. So, with that said, I think we are going to go ahead and get out of here. You guys have been fantastic. Jump into the comments on YouTube. Please subscribe to the show. Show your support. Go ahead and share the show out. Tell a friend, all that. And, of course, you can follow at GaryWCE or at Winning Cures for that. Thanks for listening to the Winning Cures Everything podcast. The website is winningcureseverything.com, and if you want to connect with us, we're on Twitter at GaryWCE, at Chris B. Giannini, at Winning Cures, or you can email us, Gary at winningcureseverything.com or Chris at winningcureseverything.com. Subscribe everywhere you need to subscribe, and we'll see you soon.